morning. Good morning. Did I push the button? There it goes. Good. It's good to see you here today in God's house. And I just wanted to begin <clears throat> with uh, a special prayer for Memorial Day and, uh, and just share some thoughts with you about that. Of course, we know tomorrow is Memorial Day. And it's so much more than an opportunity for us to have a picnic, right? Plus, the weather's not going to cooperate with that very much anyway. But uh, it's a day that's been set aside by our nation to remember and to honor uh, those who have uh, died in their service of our military and our armed forces. Uh, the remembrance began a long time ago, shortly after the Civil War, and uh, was known then as Decoration Day. And uh, some of you might remember, I, we always used to call it that too. Uh, it became a federal holiday in 1971. And it's interesting to me as I was looking back over stuff, because I just wanted to refresh my memory on a few things, and I saw something I hadn't seen before. That the law uh, that created Memorial Day calls, and this is a quote from the law itself, on the people of the United States to unite in prayer. And I thought, yes, we need to remember that. And recent additions to the law have included a time of 3 p.m. on the last Monday of May as a specific moment to do that. And so I want to just encourage you, tomorrow, 3 o'clock, it's, it's the law, okay? Take a moment of silence to remember those who have given, their, given themselves for our freedom and, and pray. Pray to our, to our Lord for our nation. Uh, we're going to get a head start on that today. I know it's not Monday at 3 o'clock, but we're going to get a head start today and just remember those who have, been, who have given their lives to secure our freedom and, and to defend it. And we just want to keep that in our prayers and in our thoughts. So let's uh, take a moment to pray. Lord, your word tells us in John 15 that your command is to love one another as you have loved us. And you reminded us that no one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And so, gracious Father God, we thank you, first and foremost, for the freedom that you have made available to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. He faced the enemy and willingly gave his life in spiritual battle to secure forgiveness of sin and freedom for our souls. It was such a huge cost for him to pay. He did so willingly, and we are grateful. Help us, Lord, never to forget and always to be grateful. Lord, you know, as we do, that physical freedom on this earth is also a very costly thing to secure and defend. And so we thank you, Lord, for the brave men and women who have served in our armed forces and paid with their lives so that each of us could be free to be here right now. Help us, Lord, never to forget and always to be grateful. Father, you know the broken heart of the ones who lose a son or daughter in battle. In your mercy and grace, Lord, would you bless those families of those who have given their lives in the service of our country. Because we know that when they remember Memorial Day, they also mourn. Grant them your great favor, your comfort, and your peace today and every day. Lord, we thank you that in our nation today we are free to worship. We are free to pray. We are free to read your word. We are free to speak. We are free to share. And for this, we are incredibly grateful. Still, Lord, we understand how quickly these freedoms can be taken away. And ask that you would give to us an increased awareness of the spiritual battle that we're in. Help us to stand strong in you and for your purposes. Thank you for your truth that says who the sun sets free is free indeed. We know that in you alone true freedom is found. And so we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, our savior. 
and for his glory. Amen. So remember again tomorrow, 3 o'clock, take a moment of silence out of your day and remember and pray. Pray for our nation. Pray for our families. Pray for our church. Uh, help us, Lord, never to forget and always be grateful. All right, let's uh, begin that with a little bit of worship this morning, okay? <coughs> let's all stand. to see you all here today. It's good to see all those who are at home worshiping with us online and I uh, trust that you will have a blessed time with us even though you're not physically here. Know that the Lord is with you as he is with us. And uh, isn't that amazing? I, every time I think of it, it still amazes me. Anyway, uh, just want to just remind you if you're uh, here with us today, we have our connection cards. Uh, and I ask that you would take a minute to fill, fill one out. Let us know what the Lord's been doing in your life. Uh, praises, we love to hear those all the time. Uh, jot them down and let us know how God has answered prayer. Uh, if you have prayer requests, please pass them on to us so we can pray for one another. Uh, it is so important for us to, to spend that time together in prayer. So fill that out. If you're at home and you have prayer requests or praises to share, please let us know. Uh, send, send an email, send a letter, send a carrier pigeon, however you want to do it. Just uh, let us know so we can be uh, sharing those things before the throne with you uh, in prayer and in praise. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, we welcome you, and uh, we also have visitors' packets available for those uh, who are visiting with us. Uh, see one of our greeters in the back, and we'll be sure to get you one. It'll let you know a little bit more about Lakeview Chapel, uh, what we believe, what we're, what we're here to do, our mission, uh, because, and you're welcome to be engaged in that mission with us as we uh, connect, uh, <clears throat> connect with one another, connect people with God, and uh, and, oh, first was connect with God. That's a given, isn't it, that we want to connect with God? So I got I to gotta brush up on that. But you guys are looking at it. That's how you knew it, right? See? I, I got it. All right. Anyway, I'll, I'll read through this stuff a little more later. Uh, <clears throat> now I've totally lost where I was going anyway. 
Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, those are things that are going on here in God's house. I want to remind you of a couple. Uh, first of all, talking about praises, I want to share this praise with you. And I just say thank you to all of you who gave so freely uh, to our Great Commission Day offering, sending f to send 40 uh, new international workers to the fields where God has called them to serve. Uh, the National Office, office reminded us uh, in the videos and some of the written material they sent that goers need senders. Well, thank you for being a part of a, the sending team. I'm thrilled with how many senders responded to the Great Commission Day offering. <clears throat> which totaled $5,385. Praise God. Isn't that, praise the Lord, isn't that great? Thank you all so much for your, your generosity. I uh, praise God. Uh, I praise God with David in First Chronicles when uh, they had received an offering for the uh, building of the, the temple. He said, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? For everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your own hand. <clears throat> praise the Lord. We praise the Lord for this. And uh, we will be sure and deliver that offering to council this week as we head out. Uh, uh, Mike and Sandy and Steve and I go into council, general council of the alliance. Uh, they'll be talking more about this. And we'll be sure and deliver that. Uh, and praise God with you. So thank you. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock in the evening. That's why it was tonight. It's in the evening. Uh, this is the fifth Sunday of the month, and so it's our fifth Sunday prayer time. And Dwayne and Doris and Jeff would love to see you here in God's house to pray together. Uh, bring your requests, bring your, bring your heart ready to speak with God about the things that are going on in our world, in our church, in our church family, in our own families. So uh, be here tonight, 6 o'clock. Then next Sunday, this is something... A little, well, I don't know, it's a little different, but we're going to have worship service next Sunday. Oh, that's not different. But, but, but what we're going to be doing is having a church family uh, memorial service. Over this past year, uh, we have lost members of our church family and have not had the opportunity to gather together as family in Christ and, and mourn together and encourage one another like we normally would do because you guys are loving, caring people and I know that's what you do. It's what we do. And, uh, and so we're going to have opportunity to do that next Sunday. Uh, we'll uh, be remembering those who have, have died over this past 16 months, you know, and, uh, and give glory to God that they're with him and uh, also be an encouragement and a blessing to the families of those who are left behind. So please come next Sunday and be uh, prepared to share uh, how some of these individuals have touched your life. Uh, be prepared to uh, just come alongside one another and encourage one another and pray for one another. All right? Uh, there, we're going to have a meal afterwards, and uh, the Loaves and Fishes team uh, is, is going to be... So this is like for them two weeks in a row, because it'll be next Sunday, and then it'll be lunch on the go, which is the following Sunday. So uh, pray for them this week, too, as they get things ready. There is a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, if you would like to donate any food for the meal, they've listed out what's, what they need for the meal. If you'd like to bring some of those things in, uh, take care of that. Talk to Kelly if you'd like to help with that. Uh, like I said, the clipboard is in the back. Uh, take a minute and sign up for that, all right? There's other stuff in the bulletin, and I'm going to trust that you'll read it. You will, right? Yeah. All right, good. It, and then you tell someone who didn't read it what was there, okay? Will we do that? And, uh, and it's, it's all about knowing what's going on so we can be praying for what God, what God is doing amongst us and also participating in that as he calls us to. All right? All right, let's continue our worship then this morning. As we stand to, to sing... Um, you know, we've had the sermons lately um, but from Daniel, and the stories there are really a challenge, right, to uh, live courageously in confidence of what um, the God that we have and how he's able to deliver. He gives us that courage to dare to be a Daniel. Standing by a purpose 
Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of I'll be reading out of Daniel chapter 5 this morning, if you'd like to read along. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines may drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the kings and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from, Jer from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I've heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you could read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the kings and tell him what it means. For the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the, kings, the, those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. 
Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from the people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox, and his body was drenched with, dew of, with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and set them, sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life in all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Here is what the words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. I was just thinking that as Steve was reading that, the difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, that if we don't learn from history, we're bound to repeat it. That occurs today also. And I had a number of things I was gonna say, but somebody stole my thunder. So I'll repeat some things, and I won't tell too many stories. Uh, my wife told me not to tell them. So anyway, I like Psalms 118.24. The last time I prayed, I gave that verse then too. 118, it's very really appropriate for today. It says, this is the day, the day, the day, this is the day the Lord hath made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Well, Memorial Day has two things. We have a guilty time, a time to get together with friends and families, cook the hot dogs on a cold day, I mean a warm day, <laughs> and also a day to remember those who have gone before and paid for our freedom. Memorial Day, as Pastor mentioned earlier, I think he gave the date, 1971, became Memorial Day, officially Memorial Day. Who remembers what it was called before Memorial Day? I hear some rumbling. Declaration, Declaration Day. Not declaration, decoration. <laughs> yes, when I was growing up, I didn't know it was called Memorial Day until later on. Um, when, I was, when I was a kid, I um, went with my family and grandparents, and we went to the cemetery. We decorated the cemetery. We brought along a couple of quart jars, stopped some in a, along the way, where there was a lilac bush and grabbed some flowers 
and I was sent down to the creek to get water, and we put them in a jar and decorated the grave sites. So, but today I would also like to remember those within our congregation who have served in the service. Um, if I go back in my own family, I have to go back four generations before there was someone that was in my family that served. Uncle Tom in the Civil War. And my grandfather was named after him. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask for those to uh, stand or raise your hand if you don't wanna stand to those who have been to service. I know of at least two, and there are probably more that I don't know. So if you'd like to acknowledge who, who you are, Don, oh yeah, Stu, I forgot you, Stu, and yes. And oh, do, I, do I see one clear in the back? No, nope. okay, you're just standing up because you want to see. Okay. Okay, Stu, thank you. And oh, Art, okay, thank you. Now there's one other that is not here that I wanted to ask for his permission, his mother's permission to acknowledge. So I'm going to do it anyway. Eric Teo, our drummer, he is going into the service, and I understand the Navy later on. So we want to remember him also. Thank you, thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Well, the history part that I was going to mention, Pastor has already mentioned, and it was, uh, but it started in 1868 as a decoration, after right after the Civil War, and it wasn't any particular battle or day that was at that time, but um, it was later on uh, designated as May 30th. Well, that doesn't work out very good for a three-day weekend. So guess what? Later on, in 1971, they declared it a federal holiday and made it a three-day weekend. Um, which brings us around to where we are today. And the song that was up here, the very first word of Daniel was stand. And that's why I went mentioned this morning, that we are, those who went in the service stood before us and ahead of us and fought, and we today are to stand firm in Galatians 5.1. It says, stand fast and firm for liberty. And while I was looking that up, I came across a number of places where God said to a stand. Christ has made us free. Many have fought for cultural liberty, and many have died to gain liberty and freedom from oppression. Christ made this freedom from sin by his death on the cross. And in Ephesians 6.10, uh, they remember that portion of scripture there's a whole, uh, put on the whole armor of God. And there it says, be strong in the Lord and the power is might against four things, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. And I'll leave the explanation to all those terms to Pastor Dave in one of his sermons. Or you can do your own homework and determine um, what they all mean. By the way, prior to that, it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these four. So that gives you a heads up as to what you're looking at. So let's go to prayer, and there's many things we can bring to the Lord. And things that I don't mention Pray to the Lord about. Thank him. Praise him. 
belief for his power to be exalted and exhibited in hearts and lives. Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is for us to come before you and give you thanks and praise for this day. You have given us a new day to live for you, to tell others of you, and live by your strength. There are many, Father, that are weak. There are many needs within our own congregation that, haven't, that we do not know about, some we do. And I'm thinking of Richard Lord right at the present time, Lord. We talked with Eddie, and his father is in real need of a physical touch from you, Lord Jesus. And we lift him up. Bless him, Lord. Strengthen him. Fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. He needs that, Lord. And I'm reminded again of this weekend and those who from our congregation are serving in you, reminded of Bethany and Greg Heisen in Alaska, Lord Jesus. They've gone through a transition and a change there. Pray your your Holy Spirit be real and close to them, Lord Jesus. May they be aware that there are those praying for them uh, this morning, Lord Jesus. And as was mentioned earlier, the delegates going to council, give them safety traveling, Lord Jesus, and give them as they attend the meetings, give them the mind to uh, think upon the things that are being discussed and to digest them and come to a conclusion that you would want them to know, Lord Jesus. Thank you for those going to that. And we always want to remember our um, missionaries and most recently, Mark and Kathy, Icost. Lord, wherever they may be, Empower them with your Holy Spirit to speak your word, maybe in a congregation, maybe online, whatever the method may be, you know what that is. We do thank you for the time that they were here with us, Lord. And I pray, Father, Pastor Dave, as he brings the message this morning, that it will penetrate each individual's heart by your Holy Spirit. It will take from that that which will encourage us, strengthen us, Make us realize, Lord Jesus, that the God of old and Daniel is a God of today. We love him, praise him, strengthen him. In your name we pray, amen. Well, as our kids head out to Children's Church, you can be opening in your Bible if you have closed it again. Uh, back to Daniel chapter 5. Uh, we'll be looking there together this morning <clears throat> and uh, seeking to see uh, the patterns and the principles that God intends to, to teach to us from uh, the events that happened in Daniel's life. And today's <clears throat> with uh, King Belshazzar as well. Last week, uh, we talked about a common saying. Do you remember? Uh, we were still talking about Nebuchadnezzar last week, and the common saying was that pride comes before fall. Remember that? Nod. At least let me know. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Uh, that saying was a, was, had its foundations in the scriptures that we were reading, and uh, it was a perfect descriptor of what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar there in chapter 4. And it's interesting <clears throat> that as we get to chapter 5, Daniel talk to Belshazzar about that very thing. You know, he, he reminded him of that too. So it's good for us to remember. It just so happens that chapter 5 is the source of another common saying, two actually. You've probably heard these, that <clears throat> your, your days are numbered. You ever heard that one? You know, it's, it's, it's almost a threat-like. <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was one of the things I thought of. And then the other one, the handwriting's on the wall. Remember those, those sayings that we uh, are used today in the context of the inevitable, inevitable nature of time and fate in our world. Their origins in Daniel 5 were much deeper than that, though. <clears throat> and I want us to think about that today. The notion that 
your days being numbered is firmly based in God's hand, not in fate. You need to understand that. It's not <clears throat> the fates that control our destiny. It is God. And the proverbial handwriting on the wall addresses God's sovereign will, not chance, not, you know, just, oh, it just kind of happened that way. You know, because we see that so clearly in the event with Daniel and King Belshazzar. From it, we're reminded of the common theme. Okay, we've got some common sayings. Well, I want to be reminded of the common theme throughout the entire book of Daniel. You've heard it a number of times already. Do I trust you to say it to me? Yeah, despite appearances... See, oh, you make me so happy. <laughs> Despite our appearances, God is in control. And more specifically, today we see that he, God, is the final judge, not man. God is the final judge, not man. So I want us to look at these events again that, that Steve read for us from Daniel chapter 5 to see how this truth affects your life and mine. <clears throat> because it's one thing to say, oh yeah, that happened to Belshazzar and Daniel, and say, oh, good story. It's another thing entirely to say, what does that mean to me? How does that change my outlook on life? How does that change how I live? So I want for us to see how this truth affects our lives as we live as Jesus followers in a world that is growing more and more opposed to the way of God. King Belshazzar, <clears throat> you, you've heard the story. I, I hope that you're appreciating hearing the whole story e each Sunday. Uh, my intention is to do that is so that we get to hear that clearly, uh, the whole story from God's word. Uh, and so I want to give you just a little quick synopsis to kind of draw out some high points. <clears throat> King Belshazzar was the son of Nabonidus. I get his name right, okay? Uh, who is recorded as the last king of Babylon. And, you know, for a long time, that caused uh, biblical scholars a lot of headaches because they said, wait a minute, Daniel said, you know, went right from Nebuchadnezzar and said, Belshazzar was the last king. How'd that happen? Because in all the other records that they, you know, archaeology has shown, it was uh, Nabonidus. <clears throat> so we found, and I won't go into the long details of it, but they have since found more evidence that Belshazzar was a real guy and they uncovered some of the story. He was Nabonidus' son and they had a, uh, as fathers and sons sometimes do, a little time of headbutting, you know, not seeing eye to eye on things. And although it wasn't an official coup, uh, Nabonidus left Babylon uh, for his own safety uh, and was overseeing another region of the empire while Belshazzar took over the uh, throne in Babylon. So, once again, archaeology proves God's word. You know, we, you see it all the time. And, and the things that we, we just have to be looking at that. Anyway, so <clears throat> Belshazzar was his son. Uh, and uh, in the last days of the empire, he was co-regent in charge of Babylon during his father's absence from the capital for his own safety. <laughs> uh, that's, and that is interesting, too, because that's why what he offered to the, anyone who could tell him what the handwriting meant was to be the third most powerful man. That was all he could do, because his dad was still really the guy, and he was co-regent, and so third is best I can do. You know? So that, that was, it was interesting to see how that all came together. Anyway, here in Daniel 5, Belshazzar is throwing a party for a thousand of his closest friends. You know what that looks like. Uh, they, they were partying in the palace. And uh, under the influence of wine, it says, uh, he breaks out the gold and silver vessels that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar when God had handed Jerusalem over to the Babylonians. It was an act designed to mock and belittle a conquered Israel. And in Belshazzar's mind, 
their weak God. Using these vessels that had been sanctified to God, Belshazzar toasted his gods, the lifeless gods made of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. As, as that was happening, as that was happening, just the tension in the room, you can see it, a disembodied hand appeared and began to write on the plastered walls of the palace. <clears throat> That'll get your attention, won't it? Kind of, and and it was, it, he did it right by the lamp stain that was casting the light into the room, so it, it, was, it wasn't like happening in the shadows, you know, like, ooh, is that real thing, or are my eyes? No, it was right out there where everybody could see. And it terrified Belshazzar. He had no idea what it said or what it meant, but still it filled him with dread, and he called for his wise men to interpret. But again, as we've seen in the first four chapters of Daniel, they weren't up to the task. They are like, yeah, I don't know. All the ruckus got the attention of the queen mother and whoever she was, because there's a lot of debate about whose mother she actually was. But anyway, uh, she knew about Daniel from his service to Nebuchadnezzar. And so she told Belshazzar, hey, you need to call for Daniel. This is the guy. He's come through in the past. You need to call for Daniel because he's always been able to reveal mysteries uh, for Nebuchadnezzar, your predecessor. And so Belshazzar did, and Daniel did. He showed up, and he told him uh, what was going on. And the news was not good for Belshazzar because the hand had written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. A lot's been written about how these four words fit with the interpretation that Daniel offered. Uh, but I, I want us to just be satisfied with the meaning that Scripture records for us, okay? When Scripture interprets itself, that's always the best interpretation. So we hear what God's Word says in verses 26 to 28, where it says, this is the interpretation of the message. Mene means that God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel means that you have been weighed in the balance and found deficient. Perez means that your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. That's what Daniel had to say to Belshazzar. And before the night was over, Belshazzar was dead. And the empire had fallen to Darius the Mede the ruler of the Medes and Persians. So <clears throat> earlier I asked, as, as you endeavor to live as a faithful Jesus follower in a world that opposes and contradicts our beliefs more and more each day, what truth from this event makes, makes an impact on your life? Because it's one thing to get caught up in the story and the drama of it, and ooh, it's kind of exciting, but... How does that affect me? How does that affect you? Daniel wants us to see that God is the final judge, not man. God is the one, as we've said before, who is in control completely. God was the one who handed Israel over to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in the first place. And in the same way, God was the one who handed over Belshazzar to the Medes and Persians. And all everything in between, God was in control. The fate of empires and nations, as well as the fate of each individual's life, is in the hands of God. Your life, my life, in His hands it is his sovereign will that directs history. We need to keep that in mind as we hear the stories from history, as we see what's happening in our world today. It is God's sovereign will that directs history. The hand that was writing on the wall was God's. 
the outcome of the attack of the Medes and Persians was directed by God. It was God who had already numbered Belshazzar's days. David wrote of that for all of us in, in Psalm 139. When David wrote, all my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them came to be. It's true for all of us. All of our days, God knows, they're, they're in his hand. They're written in his book, even before one of them came to be. And so, mene, mene, your days are numbered. Yes, God is in control from beginning to end. But he also wrote Tekel. It is, it is God who will judge every person. And I want you to see that only his verdict matters. Only God's verdict matters. Your, your prestige, your wealth, your respect, whatever, whatever you're standing on, you're saying, this is what makes my life important, none of it matters if God finds you deficient. If God weighs your life and says, mm, you don't measure up. It just doesn't matter what other people think of you because only God's judgment matters. And this is to impact us as followers of Christ. You see, the world so often sees Christians as intolerant and judgmental and self-righteous. And you know what? There have been some who've claimed the name of Christ who have given very good reasons for them to think that. Those, those judgments of the world did not come about in a vacuum. But as Jesus followers, we know that we should be known as the most gracious and compassionate and redemptive people around because that's who Jesus is and he is living in us. It's why Jesus told his followers not to judge. Do not judge so that you won't be judged, he said in Matthew 7, for you'll be judged by the same standard with which you judge others and you'll be measured by the same measure you use. So Jesus' word to us was, don't judge. Don't judge others. <clears throat> and, and we get into all kinds of a uproar about this. Well, wait a minute. How can I ignore what's going on around me and what's going on in other people's lives? You know, it, it doesn't match up with God's word. Or, and, well, yes. It's because of this word judge. We need to recognize that there's a difference between assessing and judging. Okay? Let me just break this down just a little. There's a difference between assessing and judging. And we need to learn the difference. Uh, there's a, a wonderful book, The Good and Beautiful Life by James Bryan Smith, points this out. He points out that assessing others' behavior is an essential function in our everyday life. We have to, we have to assess other people. And we do it all the time. Parents pay attention to their children's behavior. You're assessing your kids all the time, aren't you? Yeah, you're watching them. <laughs> and it doesn't matter when they grow and move out, you're still watching them, right? Go ahead, you can admit to that. We assess their lives. Teachers take attendance. They grade papers. They're assessing their students all the time. But assessing and evaluating, even grading someone's actions is not the same as judging. And I want you to recognize the difference here. Judging is making a negative evaluation of others without standing in solidarity with them. Do you see that? Judging is making a negative evaluation of others without standing in solidarity with them. Judging, when I, when I read this, it makes me, judging is like a drive-by shooting. That's how I envision it. It's like a drive-by shooting. We criticize, and we sh we're anxious to shoot those out. But 
We're not doing it like a friend who wants to help. We just fire our accusations and keep moving on. Good luck with that is our attitude. That's judging. Instead, like our God, we need to honestly assess while we walk alongside of one another, graciously forgiving and offering to help in the problems that they're having. You see, as Christ followers, we are called when we see someone in sin and down, down and out, we're called to reach down, not just wag our finger at them. Do you see the difference? We can assess other people's lives and actions. We should. I had a, a, a dear friend of our family. I called him Uncle Dan. He wasn't related, but he was like family to us. And uh, <clears throat> he would often tell me, he said, listen, not, I'm, I'm not judging anyone. I'm just a fruit inspector. I mean, I look at the tree and I say, hmm, apples. I can do that pretty certainly. Look at the tree. Okay, there's pears. And that's what we're called to do. I mean, we're going to assess. We're going to see people in their lives, especially people we care about and are close to. We need to reach out to them and say, listen, I see this behavior, and it doesn't line up with God's word. How can I help you? How can I help you? I'm here to walk with you through it because I love you and I care about you. Isn't that what Jesus did? He never denied anyone's sins. He would just say, yeah, he told the Samaritan woman, yeah, you know, you, you're right. You're, you don't have a husband, and the guy you're living with isn't your husband. You haven't had one. You have five different husbands already. You know, he didn't pull any punches there, but he said, let me give to you life, real life, that will free you from this sin. That's what God wants us as his children to do. Because only God's verdict matters here. Only his judgment matters. So we don't need to be judging one another. We need to be helping one another. It's because of God's perfect justice and grace that we can trust God to be the judge. We don't have to. We don't have to judge. Let God do that. Tekel, you've been weighed in the scales and found to be deficient. Why? Because God is doing the weighing. God alone is the judge, not you, not me. God is in control from the beginning to the end. His judgment alone is all that matters. And the last thing we see about our God here is that he never makes a mistake. Nebuchadnezzar was judged for his arrogance. And it's, you know, it's interesting because Daniel told the whole story again of, of chapter 4 to, to Belshazzar. He wanted him to remember this is where this is coming from because maybe, and others have said, oh, I read this and I look at this, chapter 4, chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar was judged for his arrogance. But he was offered an opportunity to repent and be restored to his rule. Belshazzar lost his life that night. And the empire all, all at once. What was the difference, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar? Listen to what God told Belshazzar through Daniel there in verse 22. He, he, as I said, he recapped Nebuchadnezzar's experience with his arrogance and then in verse 22, God said through Daniel, But you, his successor, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, even though you knew all of this. You knew all of this. God told Belshazzar, You have no excuse. No one will be able to stand before God and offer a viable excuse for our sin. None of us can. 
We're pretty good at justifying it to ourselves, but none of that will wash with God. That was Paul's conclusion in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. When he says, for his invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. Well, I didn't know anything about God. The evidence was all around you. No one in America will ever be able to say, I, I had no way of knowing that there was a God. There are churches on every corner, broadcasts all the time. The word of God has been proclaimed. If, if you're not listening, the only reason is you're doing this. People are without excuse. And so God's judgments will always be right. No one will be able to argue that they have a, oh, but I have a good reason. Mm, no. And God's judgments will always accomplish God's perfect will. He never makes a mistake. And so for Belshazzar, the word was Perez, the singular form of parson. Just in case you wanted to know, that was just, just the same thing. Your kingdom is divided. You're going to lose it. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Because God dispenses perfect justice and grace always. <clears throat> These things that Daniel told Belshazzar are true for all of us. And that's why I want us to see that your days are numbered. Your days, my days. We have been weighed in the balances and found deficient as well. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And justice is assured. No one's going to skip it or miss it. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's true for all of us that the wages of our sin is death. But I want to tell you this, because you're hearing this today, whether it's here or at home, because you're hearing this today, it means that you have an opportunity to avoid Belshazzar's fate. Because of God's promise that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Did you hear that? Everyone. There's no long form to fill out. And you have to check all the boxes, and if you miss one, sorry, end of the line for you. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And remember, his judgment's the only one that matters. He doesn't say, Jeff, what do you think about that? You know, No, he doesn't do that. Knowing these truths about who God is and how he acts can either frighten you like it did Belshazzar or calm you like it did Daniel. And it all depends on which side of the line you're standing. Have you called on God to be saved? If you have, you can stand like Daniel and just say, this is, what it is. this is what it says. This is what it is. You can keep your reward. It doesn't matter to me. It's not going to be worth anything tomorrow. You can keep your opinion of me in this world because it doesn't matter because God's judgment is all that counts. I'm just telling you, here's the way to life. So this truth can either calm you like it did Daniel or it can terrify you when you realize, oh, my sin, it leads to death. Not just physical death, but also spiritual death for eternity. The difference is in your relationship with God. 
And if you're here today and you have never asked Jesus to forgive your sins and be the Lord of your life, you've never made that commitment to follow him, say, Lord, I want to be a Jesus follower. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to listen to your word. I'm going to do my very best to obey. I want to follow you. If you've never made that choice in your life, then today is the day you have an opportunity right now. Because our days are numbered. We have been weighed, and our sin condemns us. God's judgment is coming. As certainty as anything that we know in this world. Now is your chance. Right where you are to say, Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. I have rejected you and rebelled against you all my life. Please forgive me. I want to turn that around and follow you. And if you make that choice, whether you make that just five seconds ago or 50 years ago, we rejoice because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You begin that relationship with him. It's the best choice you'll ever make. I just ask, if, if you've prayed that prayer, whether here or at home, let me know. Because I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you. I want to know that, yes, I want to rejoice with you. Another brother or sister in Christ. Woo-hoo. If you made that decision a long time ago, maybe Memorial Day is a good day to do some other remembering as well. Remember what Jesus has done for you. Remember the path that he is calling you to follow. Renew and grow in your relationship with him. That'd be a good thing. (laughs) Because it's something we all need. Gracious Father God, I thank you so much for your word. The truth that is there to remind us that you are the judge. Your opinion is the only one that matters. Lord, help us as we live in this world where not everybody acknowledges that. Help us, Lord, to stand firm in our understanding. That no matter how things appear, you are the one in control. You are the giver of life. So, Lord, that we will not be dissuaded from our path in following you. By your spirit, do that work in our hearts today. We will give you the glory and praise always. So we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's all stand.
sword and shield, though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind, the God of angel armies is always by my side, the one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine, the God of always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. Your will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I Gracious Father God, it is good to know that we don't have to shout our prayers really loud because you're so far away. No, you are right by our side always. And we thank you. Lord, as we leave your house today, as we head out into the remainder of this day and the week that you've set before us, Lord, we don't know everything that's going to happen. We make plans, but Lord, they're like written in the sand. And so we ask that you would guide us each step of the way. That in everything you lead us into, you would provide us with everything we need to be obedient to you. Because, Lord, we submit now to your guidance and provision in our lives. And head out into this day and this week only because you are going with us. Lord, we ask that you would make that guidance clear to us and that we would see your hand at work in us and through us. But, Lord, we trust you to have that happen. Help us to trust you even more, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you would use us in some way to make a difference in someone else's life too. That they would see you living in me. 
and be encouraged, be drawn to you. Lord, you accomplish your will in their lives, but Lord, use us as your church, as your ambassadors. Lord, help us, please, to represent you well. And in every way, we will give you the glory for it, Lord, because we recognize this is not about anything that we are able to accomplish. It is only because of you. And so we ask these things in the name of Christ for his glory and his honor and his praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's go with God.